It's good to be here. It's good to be among friends. I don't think I've ever given a lecture uh, with so many friends in the audience. Um, and that, that's very pleasing. It makes my life easy. Um, I want to begin by, by thanking the Lit and Phil for inviting me at the suggestion of my friend Bridget Toll and by thanking Simon Dixon and Liz Blood of the University Library Special Collections Department uh, for providing me with historical material. Uh, Simon and Liz are the, the central figures in our university history project, project. And if you think you can help with the project, with your memories, because some of you are very old, I see, or with any <laughs> documents or photographs in your possession, you can find details on the slide that I'll show at the end. Um, I also want to thank those of you who wrote to me suggesting that your department should be the star exhibit in this talk. Um, I shall aim to disappoint you in equal measure. Now, we all um, identify with the university in some way, so we all have personal histories, and those histories have been framed by our own experience and indeed our own perspectives. Take, for example, Lord, Lord Baker of Dorking, who in 1988 was the Secretary of State for Education. Hansard records that Keith Vaz, the Honourable Member for Leicester East, addressed the Right Honourable Kenneth Baker across the floor of the House, declaring that the Secretary of State will recall that he recently visited Leicester University. He will remember that visit because he was hit by a very large pot of yoghurt, which I deplore because it was a waste of yoghurt. <laughs> in reply, Mr. Baker said, I was delighted to meet the honourable gentleman in Leicester, but I am sorry that he was not walking with me shoulder to shoulder <laughs> through his supporters. I dare say Lord Baker still thinks of this university in terms of what uh, a senior official described as an admirably well-aimed pot of yoghurt. Now, I, I arrived at the university in 1979, and my colleagues, of course, briefed me. I learned, for example, that the Fielding Johnson building, the opulent palace of the administration, had soft toilet roll, whereas academics had to make do with waxed paper. It was also said that the, the vice chancellor's corridor was, was thickly carpeted so that the noise of footsteps didn't disturb the slumbers of our senior colleagues. <laughs> A few years later, I temporarily hopped the fence and spent uh, a long summer as an administrator based in the Fielding Johnson building, and so saw the academics from the other side of the fence. Academics from that perspective were people who spent much of their time working from home, uh, sometimes in the garden, and a few of their number worked throughout the summer at their houses in the south of France. Now, in truth, through all my decades at the university and my experience as, as, as a beginning and an end, of course, academics and administrators regarded each other as colleagues in a common enterprise, thanks in large part to the benign tone set by registrars and academic registrars. That was an admirable feature of the university. It was one of the reasons why I enjoyed working here in a way that wouldn't be possible in a university in 2018. We were, a, we were a community. Every year, the university published a red book that listed the home address and telephone number of all members of staff, including the vice chancellor, uh, including members of the medical faculty, and we were licensed to interfere in other, our colleagues' lives any time to ring them up to ask for a bit of medical advice or make suggestions about how the university should be run. It was a different world, and uh, perhaps that rightly consigned to history. Now, there's a second historiographical point that I'd want us to remember which is that institutional history, which is the dullest of historical genres, is often designed to ratify and glorify the present. Think of Magna Carta. Parliament is very important to us. The best funded research projects in Britain are funded by Parliament uh, for its own history. And we value Magna Carta because it was where Parliament started. But in terms of the 13th century, it scarcely had any impact at all, on, or certainly none on ordinary people. It was little more than a tiny incident. So 
the perspective from the glories of the present distorts the past in that it emphasizes unduly those elements that led to the present. Now this is important for my purpose this evening because many of the, the finest elements in the university's history did not lead to the present and came to an end. Um, when I arrived here, we had, for example, departments of botany, religion, economic and social history, music, philosophy, French, Italian, German, classics, uh, astronomy and history of science, a university press, now all long gone but nonetheless important and valued strands in our history. More recently, we might point to common rooms or combined studies or our campus in Malaysia, in which I spent a lot of time, uh, or Vaughan College or the university bookshop or Senate and Council dinners, all important features in our past, but not of our present. Now, there's a perfectly good reason for this, which is that in any good university that is obliged to be competitive, and there are, of course, two in England that don't have to, have to be competitive, our activities and our structures and our provision must be under constant critical scrutiny. Everything we do has a shelf life. And in changing, we are not repudiating the past, but rather trying to improve upon it and adapt and enhance our capabilities for the present and for the future. Sir Morris Schock said in his last annual report, in a university, any thought of a steady state is already an indication of decline. Constant development is the mark of intellectual vigor. <coughs> Now, that's certainly true, but I observe that in this university, as in others, uh, there's a cyclical element. If you think of decision-making and financial responsibility, for example, they're both distinctly tidal, sometimes devolved, sometimes centralised. In periods when, it's, when it, money was devolved, it had to be spent by the end of the financial year. Um, Hans Kornberg, later Sir Hans, I, some of you will remember him, our foundation professor of biochemistry, once stood in the common room announcing that he was looking for good ideas to spend the surplus in his departmental account by the end of the month. And of course, academic provision can also be cyclical. We offered midwifery training from 1928 to 1947 when it was handed over to the hospital authorities. Five months ago, we revived the subject and appointed our foundation professor of midwifery. I find that very satisfying. Now, all of this informs what I'm, what I'm going to be saying in two ways. First of all, I'm interested in individual voices, though in a public forum like this, I'm going to stick for the most part to the voices and accomplishments of the safely dead. I had an experience some years ago of describing in a public speech a professor who had gone to the great seminar room in the sky and I s described him as being notoriously grumpy about his colleagues only to receive a note from him saying that he was neither dead nor grumpy. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <coughs> second, I, I want to try and recover these, some early attitudes. I observe, for example, that our attitude to war has changed. We've never recovered from the disillusionment with mass slaughter in the fields of Flanders. We no longer see war as a theatre in which glory and honour can be achieved, but rather as a necessity born of any lack of a realistic alternative. Some do not even grant that. At the bottom of Peace Walk, downhill from, from Lutchen's magnificent memorial, is a stone inscribed with, all we are asking is give peace a chance. Now that hippie sentiment irritates me every time I walk by it, but it also reminds me how much attitudes have changed. In this context, we don't advertise our university to prospective students as a living war memorial. Uh, to the Great War. Students are much more interested in nightlife than in war memorials. But that is exactly what it is. And in thinking about our past, especially where we are now within a few weeks of the centenary of the armistice, we should celebrate those origins, especially as they make us unique in Britain and almost in the world. The only other contender known to me is, is Memorial University of Newfoundland, which celebrates Newfoundlanders who died in, in both wars. 
Now, our university has a, a prehistory which reaches back to the late 1880s to meetings of the Lit and Phil, in which a succession of members of that society suggested that the town needed a college. There was already a working man's college, founded in 1862, which became Vaughan College, but no institution of higher education. In 1912, the idea of a college was revived by Ashley Clark, who was a consultant radiologist at the, the Leicester Royal Infirmary. Dr. Clark was president of the Lit and Phil, and throughout his year in office, he generated support for the contention that Leicester needed a university college, and he returned to the subject again and again. When war broke out, Dr. Clark became Lieutenant Colonel Clark of the Royal Army Medical Corps, and he was appointed to um, head the military hospital, formerly the Lunatic Asylum, now the Fielding Johnson Building. Um, there are predictable jokes that its, its function hasn't, hasn't changed at all. And the, the um, vehicles parked in front are, are military ambulances. Um, now, on the 14th of November, um, four days after the conclusion of the bat Battle of Passchendaele, Passchendaele in Flemish, there were 550,000 casualties in that battle, and it included the deaths of 1,300, 1,300 men from Leicester. Now, the impact of that on the city was, was colossal. The Leicester Daily Post called for the establishment of something more than a mere artistic war memorial. I'm not sure I like that collocation, mere artistic. But anyway, th they proposed a college to, to commemorate lives lost and lives damaged by serious injury. Six days later, the Battle of Combray started. And those resisting the huge German counterattack included the Leicestershire Regiment, who again suffered grievous losses. The moment of relative peace during which the idea of a living memorial was launched then lasted only 10 days, but the idea had traction and it was actively pursued as the war continued its deadly harvest of young lives. On Armistice Day, Astley Clark opened the fund with a donation of £100. Dr F.W. Bennett, a local surgeon and geologist, added £500, and 14 months later, the fund passed the 100,000 mark, much of which was donated by grieving parents and grieving widows. On the 4th of April, 1919, came the biggest gift of all, when a local businessman called Thomas Fielding Johnson, aged 90, announced that he had bought the former lunatic asylum for £40,000 and was donating it to the town of Leicester as a site for the proposed university college and the two Wigiston schools, the boys and the girls schools. The software on, if, as I convert prices, the software I use is, is measuringworth.com. I don't know what the, the number crunchers among you think of it, but it measures the increase um, by the, uh, the, the, the crude measure of, the, of the, uh, the increases in the retail price index. And it converts um, Fielding Johnson's gift um, into £1,850,000. Um, that was the wealth of the university then. I was in Saudi some years ago, and I was approached by a wealthy Saudi asking if we would be interested in selling the university, which he was interested in buying. Um, I duly passed the query over to the vice chancellor at the time, who said that he was sorely tempted by the offer. <laughs> Um, note that uh, Fielding Johnson's address up at the top is Brookfield, uh, which is now owned by the universities. Now, big donations encourage other big donations. So £20,000 was soon, soon given by, by um, Harry Simpson G., uh, the father of Percy G. The Lit and Phil was again involved. And in 1920, it undertook to provide a botanical garden for the college. Now, the garden included a rock garden um, with uh, 
and there's, there's some signs of a stream. I don't know where the stream disappeared to. It's on the space now occupied by the maintenance buildings uh, at, at, at the back of the Fielding Johnson building. But the, the rock garden was, but other bits of the botanical garden uh, surrounded the building. In 1947, uh, it was moved to Oadby, where it was initially established in the grounds of Beaumont House. Now, one aspect of the fundraising that has remained in the shadows is the contribution by local women, a subject that Simon Dixon has been in investigating. Local headmistresses such as Florence Rich, who founded the Granville School for Girls, uh, and Sarah Heron, who presided over Wigston Girls School, raised more than £15,000. That's £570,000 in today's money. Similarly, the Belmont House Society, which was established for former pupils of the school in what is now the, the Belmont Hotel, contributed both money and influence. They were married to, to influential men. One of the key women was Agnes Archer Evans, the last headmistress of Belmont House, who served on the council of Vaughan College and in 1913 became the first female president of the Lytton Phil. Now, on the 4th of October 1921, less than three years after the armistice, the College of Leicester, Leicestershire and, and Rutland opened with 11 students, three lecturers a, and a principal, Robert Rattray, who was minister of the Great Unitarian Meeting and an active member of the Lit and Phil. Every new university needs a motto and, uh, and uh, a coat of arms, as we know from the stampede to the College of Heralds every time the Department for Business creates what it's pleased to call a new university. Um, Dr. Rattray chose the motto, um, Ut Vitam Habeant, which is John 10.10 in the Vulgate Bible, that they might have life. Um, the verse continues, uh, et abundantius habeant that they might have it more abundantly. Now in Dr. Rattray's capacious understanding, the phrase was intended to commemorate the dead and the wounded and indeed all who had made sacrifices, but also to celebrate those who would have a more abundant life because of the higher education that they experienced at the new college. The coat of arms, which is now um, slightly redesigned but has the same elements, the university logo has a shield with an open book uh, signifying a seat of learning, uh, two sink foils representing Leicester and Leicestershire, and a horseshoe representing Rutland. The griffin on top is taken from the arms of Fielding Johnson in acknowledgement of his gift of the campus. Now, sometime in the first year, this photo, which many of you will have seen, um, was taken. It shows nine students, um, all uh, women, including uh, Rhoda Bennett on the, the upper left, standing on the upper left, and uh, seated in the middle, Principal Rattray, and two members of staff, uh, Miss Meesham um, on his right, our left, with the, the great hat, uh, and who taught botany, and on the other side, Mr. Gibbs, the college secretary, the pre predecessor post of, of registrar. And Mr. Gibbs had, had, during the war, persuaded the government to remove the duty on cigarettes given to servicemen in local hospitals so that they could smoke more. Uh, this now seems a less laudable act than it did at the time. Now, there were two other members of the teaching staff, uh, Miss Salson, who taught geography, and, and Mademoiselle Chapuzet, who taught French. Now, one might think from this photo that ours was a woman's college, in which both staff and women and, and staff and students were women. And indeed, the first published history of the university working from this photo said precisely that. Um, the staff and the students were all women. Uh, that was almost true, but two male students are missing from the photograph, uh, possibly because they didn't turn up, but more likely because they'd already left the university. One of them had gone on to Oxford. And as for the teaching staff, Dr. Rattray also taught himself. Um, he, he taught English and Latin. So the students studied everything that was taught, English, Latin, French, geography, and botany. That was the syllabus. And they were entered for the University of London external degrees. Uh, 
Now, the woman seated on the right is of, of interest, at least to me. Uh, she was Nellie Bonsaw, the daughter of an impoverished widow in Wigston who took in laundry to make a living. Nellie became the first president of the Students' Union. I find it pleasing that our aspiration to accommodate a broad social range of students was realized in our very first intake with a woman who, who went on to, to succeed. Now, the women were expected to behave properly and so were forbidden to smoke. Um, uh, but eventually this rule was relaxed and here's the news story covering it. Uh, my, they were allowed to smoke but only on the college grounds. Um, my Lady Nicotine, um, who's in the... Uh, uh, the, the cartoon was, is a reference by, to a novel by J.M. Barry, he of, he of Peter Pan, it's a dreadful novel. Um, you hardly need reminding that uh, attitudes to smoking have changed, but I'm going to remind you anyway. Um, I was lecturing in Mississippi uh, 10 days ago and heard myself uh, in the course of a lecture referring to an advertisement for Pall Mall cigarettes, which ran... Want to be the next president? Just do what Ronald Reagan does and smoke lots and lots and lots of Pall Mall brand cigarettes. The sooner you start, the faster you'll rise to political success. <laughs> Don't delay, start smoking today. Smoking isn't hazardous, it's fun, delicious and cool. Now, a hundred years on, our smoking is disappearing, but it's still an unresolved issue um, in that we still permit, permit smoking on the campus, unlike Australian universities, for example, partly because smoking bans are unpopular with international students. We, in other words, we persist in fostering an environment that makes it easy for students to start smoking. I'm not wholly convinced this is a good idea, uh, but I defer to my, my betters on this. Now, I digress once again. The new college was financed by benefactions and the town council. But because it was the Lit and Phil that established the university rather than the town council, Leicester was never a civic university in a sense that Nottingham, Sheffield, Leeds, Liverpool and Manchester are. And so we, unlike all of those, have long enjoyed a good relationship with the council. We are not their creature. Um, and and that's, been, uh, that, that's been an advantage through all the years I've been here. I should perhaps add that all funding for the University College was local, which is to say it was from Leicester and its suburbs. The county took much longer to support us because its efforts were concentrated on Loughborough College. So the, the county was doing Loughborough, the city and its suburbs were doing the, the University College. The University Grants Commission had been established in 1919, but Leicester received no public funding from the Treasury um, until 1946. We were a private college. Now, in the early years, the students were local. Um, the student body in the second year of operation consisted of 28 day students and 62 evening students. By the measure of numbers, adult education was more important than the education of young people. The great and the good who oversaw the university were also local. This is an image of those who uh, were present at the opening of the library in, in 1923. Um, at the top, you have Lord Haldane, who was the college visitor. Uh, on the left, uh, Sir Jonathan North, the chair of council, a local alderman in the middle, and Dr. Rattray, who was the principal on, on the right. Uh, lower down on the left, the mayor, um, Amos Sheriff, and below him, from left to right, uh, Thomas Fielding Johnson, uh, Frank Woods, who was the Bishop of Peterborough because Leicester didn't have its own bishop until it became a city in 1927. Um, and Sir Samuel Fair, uh, who was a local businessman and a member of council. At the bottom on the left, 
the Reverend Canon James Went, who even on the Lit and Phil site, his, his name is, uh, uh, is misspelt, but it, it, it just went as in gone. Uh, headmaster of the Boys Grammar School uh, for 43 years, a former president of the Lit and Phil, and in that capacity in 1885 became the first person to leave a historical record of having suggested that Leicester needs a university college. Um, the final figure, um, Sir Arthur Wheeler, uh, in the, in, at the bottom was a prominent local stockbroker uh, who was eventually uh, jailed for fraud. Um, <laughs> they were all top people, with the exception of Amos Sheriff, um, who never went to school, who labored in a brickyard from the age of six and became the first labor mayor of Leicester. As you can see, nine white men of an age that I used to think of as old. Now, in common with other uh, institutions of the period, we've managed to write women out of our history and found ways of excluding them from uh, senior positions. As late as 1988, which for many of us is not a long time ago, uh, I protested against an all-male shortlist for a chair, not because it was all male, I don't have a problem with that, but because the outstanding candidate, who was a woman, had not been shortlisted. I took it up with the Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, who was chairing the selection panel, and he explained to me that it was much too early to think about the university having a woman uh, in an important chair. Now, there was already a woman professor, but Olive Banks had a personal chair in sociology of education, so that didn't count. <laughs> but there were women, and some of them committed their professional lives to this place. Um, Rhoda Bennett uh, is, is an absolutely outstanding uh, example. She was the daughter um, of F.W. Bennett, one of our founders. Uh, she was in the first intake of students in 1921. She was the one uh, standing on the upper left. In 1930, her father died and she and her sister donated his house on, on Regent Road to the college together with a £6,000 donation for a lectureship in geology in memory of their father. If you wind that on, it's £360,000. She trained in librarianship at, at UCL <coughs> and returned in Leicester, uh, where she was uh, returned to Leicester, where she was appointed as an assistant librarian. The following year, she became the librarian and continued in that role until she retired in 1961. When we opened the medical school in 1977, it was she that made a substantial donation that was used to create the Clinical Science Library. This was a life, a woman's life, and one of many wholly dedicated to the well-being of this university. Now, the other diversity notable for its absence in the staff, but eventually present in the student body, is ethnic. This was remedied in 1964 when the Students' Union elected as its president a Ugandan named Peter Polly Makubi, whose campaigns included one to end the colour bars in the city's pubs. And it was interesting, he chose to work not through protests, he didn't do protests, but through the quiet route of talking directly to the mayor, uh, to city councillors, to local MPs, and to the manager of Everard's, and it worked. Um, thereafter, pubs were not allowed to discriminate on grounds of race. He later became involved in opposition politics in Uganda, and in 1990, he was charged with treason, which I think is probably a first for our graduates. Um, he's now the director of a Catholic school that gives preference to poor and academically disadvantaged students. Now, our students were active in the 60s and 70s. They contributed to the improvement of race relations and disability provision with uh, the Highfields Adventure Ground, which was their, their achievement, not ours. One other remarkable student, president, student union president was, was Esuan Siva Jane Goldsmith, who in 1975 became the first woman in 50 years to be elected as president of the Students' Union. Forty years later, she recalled that she had to go to Senate meetings, me with 90-odd white guys, so I always turned up wearing banana yellow and big hair to scare the mortarboards off them. <laughs> she has gone on to become 
Commissioner for the Women's National Com uh, Commission, uh, Chair of the Fawcett Society, Chair and Co-Founder of the Gender and Development Network, Vice Chair of ActionAid UK. She's an immensely uh, accomplished woman. Her portrait hangs in the lobby of the Fielding Johnson Building. Now the third kind of diversity of which we might usefully take note is class. Uh, our record in terms of the uh, proportion of students from poor families is very good by comparison to similar institutions. What has been harder to maintain is a commitment to adult education. For decades our principal vehicle for honouring this obligation was Vaughan College, which was founded in 1862 to provide education for working class men and soon provided for working class women as well. Vaughan College merged with University College in 1929 and therefore was an important strand in provision offered by our Department of Adult Education, which offered uh, courses all over the county. We later established a university centre in Northampton to offer courses to local people. In the last 20 years, such institutions have closed all over the country largely because of the indifference of successive Philistine governments to provision that doesn't enrich the economy. I mourn their passing and I'm not alone. Now, finally, disability um, is, a, is covered by the broad uh, umbrella of diversity. This is an area in which we don't have early records, so I can only offer anecdotal evidence of an increasingly uh, positive attitude. I spent 30 years, 32 years in the upper reaches of the Attenborough Tower for a crime I, I didn't commit. Um, <laughs> and throughout that period, it had extraordinarily unreliable vertical transport because the paternoster and the lift constantly broke down. And there were years in which the unreliability of the transport meant we rejected applicants who couldn't cope with the stairs through a procedure that enabled them to have an extra UCAS place, an additional UCAS place. Now, attitudes have changed, as have teaching patterns. And now, if a student cannot reach the appropriate floor, the tutor and the other students go down to a place where, um, where, where that the student can reach. We have, however, always accepted students with visual disability. And one of my abiding memories for three years is of a sightless student with dog stepping confidently on and off the paternoster, a, frightened, a, a procedure that frightened everyone in the building except for the student and the dog who weren't bothered by it at all. <laughs> now, our major contribution in this area was, of course, the opening of the, uh, of the Richard Attenborough Centre uh, for Disability and the Arts. Isn't that a wonderful picture of, of, of Richard and David? Uh, this is uh, when they launched the, the centre in 1990 and it was opened in the, the presence of, of Princess Diana uh, in, in 1997. But I digress. <laughs> Not for the last time. Um, the, in the interwar period, the University College was tiny. It was distinguished from similar institutions by one factor, which was the determination at a very early stage to introduce experimental science beyond botany into the subject range. The college had no money to build labs, uh, so it launched a public appeal. <coughs> The appeal was only partly successful, but Percy G uh, gave £5,000 and there was enough um, money to proceed. The, la the labs that um, uh, eventuated were primitive by uh, today's standards. Uh, th this is a botany one as it happens, but they do represent a commitment to hands-on teaching, which has been a tradition of this university from the beginning. Now, in the interwar period, all subjects were taught by a single person who had to cover the entire syllabus. Uh, chemistry lecturer had to teach all of organic and inorganic and physical chem chemistry. Uh, the English lecturer had to teach all of English literature from Anglo-Saxon to the Victorian periods. Um, they were, they were, some of them were very distinguished. The lecturer in physics from 1932 was, was Leonard Huxley, uh, who was one of the first members of staff who would eventually be knighted. 
one member of staff whose star was destined to shine bright, brightly was, was Hoskins, W.G. Hoskins, who was here for three periods between 1931 and 1968. He was appointed to a lectureship in commerce in which he had little interest and taught by day, but at night, in the evening, he taught archaeology and local history at Vaughan College. Hoskins founded English local history as a discipline and he founded it here. In 1955, he published his Making of the English Landscape. I read it in 1975. I have the date inside my copy, four years before I came here, and I regard it as one of the books that has shaped me. Reading it is a transformative experience. You can never again look at the English rural landscape in the same way if you've read that book. Now, the other star in that period, albeit in a, a different firmament, um, was Malcolm Sargent. Uh, the first member of the staff other than the principal to hold a doctorate. Uh, in 1921, uh, Henry Wood had invited him to conduct his tone poem, Impression on a Windy Day at, at Leicester, and in a prom concert in London. And the following year, he was offering a course of three lectures in the history of music. Note that these are public lectures and that tickets had to be bought. The young college was very short of money and would remain so until the end of World War II. We tend to be nostalgic about these times with these grainy black and white photographs, but in truth it was a period of extreme difficulty for those who were working here. The lowest point came in 1929 when there was a bitter dispute about governance and a financial position that was perilous. Mr. Gibbs, the college secretary, took his own life by swallowing cyanide. And in his suicide note, he blamed pressure of work and the current staff dispute. I think in thinking of our history, we must remember the dark times as well as the good ones. And indeed, remember that hard times take, take, take a human toll, toll. Now, I want to make one final point about the college in the interwar period, and that's about the triangular relationship between the college, the museum, and the lit and fill. The museum and its foundation collection were, like the university, created by the lit and fill. Um, to give one example of how it, it worked then, the lit and fill's centenary in 1935 was marked by the college's botany department mounting an exhibition and demonstrations in New York Museum. So the, this was a triangular relationship. Our museum studies program is a product of that relationship. As for the museum, it may, like the university, have outgrown its parent, but filial ingratitude is a constant danger, and not just in King Lear. Now, the college's finances were transformed in 1946, when it received from heaven, they felt, a treasury grant of 12,000 pounds. In today's money, 470,000 pounds. They'd never had public money before. This led, of course, to a spending spree. Uh, academic staff, everybody got a big pay rise. Uh, the college appointed uh, 10 new lecturers and its first professors in chemistry, adult education, and education. Um, the library also expanded and it hired a, uh, a young chap called Philip Larkin in, in <laughs> characteristically hilarious mood uh, in this photo. Um, he worked for the librarian, Rhoda Bennett. Uh, he was the only adult male in the library, so his duties included um, shifting packing cases and anything that involved climbing ladders, uh, especially changing light bulbs. That was an early Larkin specialty. He lived on a bed sit in, on, in a bed sit on London Road opposite the, the park. He complained about the noise of the trams that still ran along London Road. He complained about his fellow lodgers and his relentless complaining led to his eviction. So he moved to an attic room on the second floor of a house on College Street. Again, he complained, this time about the neighbours who had wirelesses and even worse, had children. And finally, uh, he was evicted again and uh, his mother took him in and they bought a house on Dixon Drive. He took lunch at the University College because at that stage the staff assembled in a room in what would eventually be called the Fielding Johnson Building and Principal Attenborough said, 
said grace and carved the joint. It is said that members of staff who were in favor received a second slice. <laughs> now in the 1950s, I'd, I'd love this photo. I know it's posed and so on, but we had, we had greatness in our midst. I think it's the only time we have uh, in the person of Norbert Elias, arguably the greatest thinker in the history of the university, or inarguably. If you haven't, haven't heard of him, you're not alone. In a recent bestseller, the Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker described Elias as the greatest social, social thinker you've never heard of. He isn't mentioned in Brian Birch's History of the University, published in 1996. Elias was a, was a late starter. He arrived in this country um, in 1935, age 38. He taught evening classes in London until he was 58, when he landed his first full-time job, a lectureship in our department of sociology. Seven years later, he retired as a reader in sociology. He published little while he was in London and Leicester, possibly because like many Jewish intellectuals of his generation, he was a damaged man. His mother had perished in Auschwitz. In 1939, however, he had published in German a book later to be translated in two volumes as The Civilizing Process. His central insight was that manners, far from being a trivial subject for academic investigation, are in fact the outward manifestation of the processes by which humans learn to live in peace with each other. It's a, it's a beguiling thesis. Elias studied table manners and, and the control of emotions and the emergence of conventions such as the unacceptability of belching or wiping one's nose on one's sleeve or restricting uh, bodily functions to the private sphere. He was interested in uh, the excitement generated by sport and by crowd excitement, and this led directly to the establishment of sociology of sport as a discipline at this university. The collected works of uh, Norbert Elias uh, are published in 18 volumes. That can't be said for many of our colleagues. You can stick your hands up if you like. Um, <laughs> he was a celebrated European intellectual, the first recipient of the Adorno Prize, the recipient, the holder of honorary doctorates and state honors in Germany and in France and the Netherlands. But to our shame in his adopted country of Britain, there was no public recognition. When I arrived in 1979, he was listed in our calendar as part-time lecturer in sociology. Um, it, it's not a good ending. Now, our students in the post-war period included the novelist, uh, Malcolm Bradbury, and the literary critic, who's still going, John Sutherland, both in the English department. Bradbury arrived in 1950. Um, and while he was an undergraduate, he, he got bored easily. He embarked on his first novel, Eating People is Wrong, in which several of the characters are versions of uh, members of the English department that uh, uh, both Nigel and I knew. Uh, the university, in Bradbury's estimation, was a modest place, offering its graduates sober futures in low or middle management or school teaching. Um, now, John Sutherland also hints at this modesty um, in his autobiographical account of his youth, The Boy Who Loved Books. Uh, Sutherland gives a, a chapter to his time as an undergraduate at Leicester. He arrived after a stint as a laborer on the railways, wondering whether one could sink lower than the world of bucketed, oversweetened tea and the life of a rail dog. His, one, his answer was that one could indeed sink lower by going to University of Leicester. <laughs> to be accepted at Leicester, he explains, was to have failed everywhere else in academic life. You didn't come up to Leicester as posh Oxonians and Canterbridgeans said, you ended up at Leicester. Now, uh, John is immensely positive about this university now, I should perhaps add in his defense. But these thoughts prompt two, two thoughts. First, and in, in marked contrast to present attitudes, the university was utterly lacking in ambition. In the words of the first history of the university, written by Jack Simmons, the buff gray brick of which the university is built is the best emblem of its character, quiet, undemonstrative, under-emphatic. It is an authentic piece of the East Midlands. 
60 years on, we're a global university, we're numbered in the top few hundred in the world, and we have absolutely no interest in being quiet or undemonstrative or under, uh, under emphatic. Uh, we, we've changed utterly, and, and uh, three cheers for that. The second thought that emerges in those early memoirs is that we were doing a particularly fine job with, with teaching. And I, I don't say that smugly at all. Sutherland in particular talks about committed teaching that shaped his literary intelligence. He rose to become a Regis professor. He read more novels than anyone I've ever known. Uh, one of his recent books was, was called A History of uh, the Novel through the works of 294 writers. His tutor here was Monica Jones, the partner of Philip Larkin. Now Bradbury was here in the 1950s and Sutherland in the 60s. So Bradbury's degree was from London and Sutherland's was from Leicester. The intervening event was the granting of the Royal Charter, which happened in two stages. There, there are two Royal Charters. First, in 1950, the college obtained a Royal Charter and moved from being a limited liability company to an institution incorporated under Charter. Now, in terms of governance, this meant that the council, which had consisted entirely of local dignitaries, mostly businessmen, suddenly acquired eight academic members. The debate about the extent to which universities should be governed by business people or academics or a, a blend of the two has continued, of course, down to our own time, with only Oxford and Cambridge holding out for governance wholly by academics. Now, a few years later, we... Uh, we obtained the charter, and uh, I've got a picture of it here. Uh, and the post of president, later to become chancellor, which had hitherto been filled by Dukes of Rutland, which is why Rutland appears on the, uh, on, on the coat of arms. It was taken by the physiologist Lord Adrian. Master of Trinity College, Nobel Laureate, the first of three we had here, former President of the Royal Society, uh, President or Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. Now that change from uh, from landed aristocracy to academic aristocracy, aristocracy, if I can put it that way, um, was 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 significant because the formal heads of universities serve a, a purpose beyond being decorative. Lord Adrian was extensively networked in Whitehall and Westminster. He was a powerful ally in the aspiration of the college to achieve full university status. I should add that the idea of becoming an independent um, university was resisted by some members of the academic staff who preferred the security of the familiar London link to the risks of, of independence. What was needed to influence the networks of Lord Adrian was leadership. And it arrived in the person of Charles Wilson, a 43-year-old political science scientist like, like Dr. Rattray and Fraser Noble of Scott. Wilson's brief was to turn this place into a university. He was a shrewd choice, but he was a distinctly odd one. Uh, he was a progressive, he taught at Ohio State for a year and that, that corrupted him, but he was exceedingly formal, even by um, the standards of the 1950s. He was also desperately shy, he couldn't give a speech, so public speaking was a, was a trial for him. Um, his, family, his, his public speaking, according to the August Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, uh, that his family referred to his public speeches as his laxatives. Um, on the other hand, he was a consummate manager of committees, and at Leicester he restructured the finances, he initiated new syllabuses, he built a team of strong administrators in a coherent structure. He brought the same qualities to the chairmanship of the committee of vice chancellors and principals, which was deeply old fashioned. Um, members were called by the names of their institutions and like, like bishops in Trollope's novels, and they sat in order of seniority. Um, and, and along came Wilson and changed all that. Thanks to that pair, Adrian and Wilson, the college achieved its goal of becoming uh, an independent university. Now, how did it react to independence? John Sutherland says that the new institution chose not to ape its parent, the University of London, but Oxbridge, 
So instantly the university introduced gowns, college houses, maces, high tables, and dry sherry. Um, <laughs> Students as well as staff uh, were obliged to wear gowns and women students were forbidden to wear trousers except on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Um, <laughs> the gowns and the women's dress requirements were top-down impositions. Men have always loved telling women what they should and shouldn't wear. Um, and students were emphatically not customers as the government's banal idiom would have it. Uh, students were required to wear gowns when visiting their tutors and at lectures. Uh, uh, students being students, of course, they, they began to ignore these requirements almost instantly. When I arrived in 1979, there were still a few tutors um, who wore um, gowns to teach, and gowns were worn at the top table of meetings of faculty uh, and, and senate. But shockingly, women were wearing trousers every day. There was a whole <laughs> fault in leadership. Now, the history of the university since 1967 moves into the sphere of personal memory. Uh, I see Jean Humphreys regularly. All those who know her should go and visit her. Uh, and her stories take me back till, uh, to 1946. She's yet another woman who has committed her life to the university and yet another who has pres been a president of the Lit and Phil. Uh, she was present at the, the first degree congregation. Um, <coughs> at which the recipients of, or of honorary degrees uh, included E.M. Forster, as in Passage to India. He's the fourth from the left uh, the, in the front row, the one with hair. Uh, the other striking thing about it is the rows and rows and rows of university staff who were on the stage of uh, De Montfort University. I wish we could find out a way of uh, encouraging that many staff to, uh, to, to turn up now. That, that sets an example for us. Now, in the 61 years since we became a university, certain patterns have recurred. One is the difficult relationship with government, which has continued up to the present. Um, successive governments have wanted to control universities, which they have regarded crudely and instrumentally as a national resource for strengthening the economy. But universities want to be independent. In 1964, for example, the vice chancellor complained, and it's 1964, that the quantitative measures of efficiency being imposed by the government may be crudely relevant to manufacturing enterprise, but have nothing to do with intellectual thought and human qualities. In 1966, he warned of the ominous worsening of the outlook for universities. And the next year, he spoke about government undermining autonomy and imposing a uniform mediocrity on universities. Our situation in the new millennium is not at all unprecedented, if you, if you look back. Another example is finance. Financial problems that beset the college in the interwar period returned in the 1970s. In 1974-5, um, university expenditure fueled by inflation rose in the one year by 28%. And the vice chancellor admitted wearily in his annual report that in his 13 years as vice chancellor, he had never experienced such a severe and prolonged sense of depression and despondency in every sector of the university. Those words were written in the golden age of universities before 1981, when Mrs. Thatcher swung her axe and the whole university shuddered. In short, I don't think there's anything new about the difficulties now being experienced <coughs> here and in, in, in the sector at large. What I do see in Leicester is a long-term ambition, starting with a few individuals in the 1960s, to rise in the world and to be a distinctive university. We became, for example, in the words of the Times, the cradle of British sociology, which they attribute to Ilya Neustadt and, and his team. And our School of Education was regularly singled out for praise as a national asset. When we introduced law, we chose an unusual emphasis on European law. Our new medical school chose to offer a syllabus, an, an innovative syllabus that integrated preclinical and clinical subjects. When we introduced engineering, <coughs> it wasn't the single subject engineering, 
that dominated British universities, but engineering science, which we accommodated in a building that is rightly regarded as one of the most important buildings constructed in 1960s Britain. That said, the innovative nature of its, its cantilevered design has rendered it exceedingly expensive to maintain, and we've had to rebuild parts of it on three occasions. Uh, we're once again thinking about how best to do this, and that thinking has been uh, aided by the Getty Foundation. Now, the same sense of ambition is evident in our research, um, where we started slowly. For many years, this was a teaching institution. But if you think what's happened in recent decades, there's been great distinction. Think, for example, of the work of Kedden Pounds on black holes, or Alec Jeffries on genetic fingerprinting, or John Swales and Neil Shimani on heart disease, or Richard Buckley's discovery of the bones of Richard III and the subsequent analysis of those bones uh, by colleagues in other departments. <laughs> if, if such discoveries are to continue and the university is to flourish and nothing is assured at this uncertain time as Brexit approaches, we must, of course, be well-led and well-governed. We've long been fortunate in our leaders. Of the first four, uh, who've, of whom I've already spoken, three were Scots. And although our present Vice-Chancellor is not a Scot, he's a sort of honorary Scot in that he spent much of his career there. After those four came more shock, later Sir Morris, who, who died recently, an Oxford Don whose background in government and politics meant that he was supremely well-connected in Westminster and Whitehall at a time when government seemed unaware of us. Um, this proved to be very useful indeed. It was Morris Shock who carried the university through its most difficult moment, which was heralded by the UGC letter of the 1st of July, 1981, in which funding, funding was cut overnight by 15% and a policy of growth was scrapped in favour of contraction. Now, our first two principals had backgrounds in the humanities, and the three vice-chancellors who succeeded them were all social scientists. Our next vice-chancellor, Ken Edwards, was a scientist, a proper scientist. That's not polite to say that, I'll, I'll retract that. Uh, but he was. Uh, a Cambridge geneticist who understood the work of our scientists, including our medical sciences. He also held a, sing, a senior managerial position at Cambridge. This combination of science and management was timely, as our provision in science and medical science stood in need of support, and the management structures of the university stood in need of critical scrutiny. Ken was the man of the hour. In 1999, Bob Burgess, known to many of you, became our seventh leader and, and fifth vice chancellor. He was the first first person of the rank of professor to be appointed to the post, and he had standing in the profession. Bob's central conviction was that the quality of the university wasn't adequately reflected in its reputation, and he made the enhancing of that reputation his principal goal. He also had a vision of the university, of what it should be, inclusive, accessible, ambitious, empowering, uncompromising in standards, a beacon of excellence. These aspirations were part of the inheritance of our current vice chancellor who emphatically shares those ambitions. Paul Boyle came to us as an academic of unmatched distinction. Elected to the British Academy in his 40s, the average age of election is, is 62, and fresh from running a research council in which the buck stopped with him. Research funding and distinction in research must be a high priority if we are to flourish and Paul is the person who is leading us at this exceedingly difficult time when the many threats that come with Brexit include the well-being of research in our universities as we lose access to the European Research Council, of which the UK is the largest beneficiary. The best research is, of course, dependent on international collaboration, and it's increasingly difficult to make it flourish in the UK because we have a government that views international students as potential undesirable immigrants and therefore includes them in immigration quotas. <coughs> it's hard to think of a more backward-looking attitude unless it's thinking that universities should have their, thinking, their teaching labelled as gold and silver or bronze on the basis of dodgy criteria that include no actual observation of that teaching. 
Now, the damage that government inflicts on universities by such measures and the damage that Brexit is already in, in, inflicting on the sector will be disproportionately felt by small research universities like ours. And the burden will fall on the shoulders of our leaders more than it has in the past. There was a time, which I well remember, when vice-chancellors had to carry their senates with them because professors ran the universities. I, I liked that when I was a professor. There was a proposal during Ken Edwards' vice-chancellorship to merge the universities of Leicester and Loughborough. I think they'd had a good dinner together. Uh, it almost happened, and the, the planning was well advanced, but the scheme failed when the Loughborough Senate wouldn't back their vice-chancellor. Since then, vice-chancellors have had ever-increasing executive authority vested in them and bear an ever-increasing weight of responsibility. That means, in turn, that governance has become critical to the well-being of this university. And our recent chairs of council, starting with John Foster and continuing through Roger Bettles and Bridget Toll, have had to bear workloads and exercise responsibilities that were absolutely unknown in scale and importance to those of their predecessors. Now let me finish with a, one piece of advice to our leaders and governors. In the words of a commonplace articulated by James Baldwin, know from whence you came. This university came from the intellectual and educational ambitions of Lit and Phil, and from the noble wish to memorialize the dead, the wounded, and all who made sacrifices in the Great War in an educational institution for the living. Baldwin continues, if you know whence you came, there are absolutely no limitations on where you can go. That should be our resolution as we embark on our second century. Many thanks.